All right. Well, I am Alexis Wagoner. For those of you who don't recognize me by now, I am uh, the Marketing and Digital Education Director for Westar, and I am going to be talking with Reverend Lori Walkie, who is one of the ministers at Mayflower Congregational Church in Oklahoma City, and just wanted to have her on to chat about the, specifically about the abortion ban that recently passed in Alabama, but a, the larger picture around some of these issues and some of these um, bills and bans and that sort of thing. And here, Lori, your perspective as a minister, as someone who provides pastoral care around this, then also as someone who has no doubt wrestled with these things through your own journey and through scripture and through pastoring and all those good things. So I will turn it over to you and, and I'm interested to hear your thoughts. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Alexis. I think this is um, not just a timely topic, but something that Christianity has wrestled with for a long time. And I always like to start by saying, you know, abortion is considered this hot button issue and often considered the problem mm. when ultimately um, abortion is actually a symptom of a larger problem. Mm. And we're sort of asking the wrong questions about abortion. And, and we need to begin to think about abortion as a symptom of our systemic sin of systemic um, injustice in the world so that that forces um, women to have no choices and um, so it's not just about a choice to terminate a pregnancy but also choices uh, the you know when we talk about reproductive justice it's really talking about the right to have the children you want to not have children and to the right to, to raise children in healthy and safe environments, to parent um, kiddos in safe and healthy environments. And so when we think about reproductive justice in that sense, yeah, abortion is not the problem. Um, abortion is a normal medical procedure that many women, particularly in the United States, and lots of people sitting in our pews have um, experienced or know an intimate partner that has experience. Um, and so we can get lost in these abortion debates or we can start to um, create a world where uh, our paradigm is reproductive justice. Yeah, that's an interesting perspective. And I'm wondering how that in, in a, obviously, you know, you're not in Alabama, but in a place that also has large conservative constituencies in the way we often think of conservative, um, how that has played out in your own, in your own church, in your own community, um, and what sort of conversations and things like that you've been able to engage in around those issues. Sure, it's tough. Oklahoma is a very red state and um, very, very conservative, um, although apparently not maybe quite as conservatives of Alabama. <laughs> Although, I don't know, um, at this point, you know, when things like this happen, then it inspires movements from other fundamentalists, and so they kind of uh, get to work. But I think one of the most powerful things that um, we can do as communities, whether we're in very liberal contexts or in very conservative contexts, is to tell our stories. And this can be really difficult around the specific issue of abortion um, because it is um, very heavy and um, it, there are all kinds of big emotions associated with it. But what, I think what you're seeing a lot on social media um, as far as like hashtag trends, like you know me, the hashtag you know me, um, is are, are people beginning to tell their stories to say, hey, here's what happened when I got an abortion. And it ranges from, this was a, a medical, a standard medical procedure to, um, it was a heart-wrenching decision because this was a pregnancy I really wanted mm -hmm. and really grieved the loss of the, this potential child. Mm -hmm. And um, all of those stories are really important to hear. And um, it makes it really hard when you know somebody's story, when you can say, well, I know so-and-so who I love, who has been a lifelong friend to me, who's shown up at the hospital and when my mom was sick and when my dad was dying, I know them and I know their experience. And so now I'm not going to perhaps dig in as deeply in my, my entrenched position, um, or I'm not going to say, um, 
or make the judgments that I maybe have held for a long time or made in the past. It just shifts the dynamic. Yeah, I think that's all right. Around so many issues, is it's a lot easier to have a certain opinion when it doesn't affect someone that you know or someone that you're close right. to or someone in your community. And I'm interested too, because I know for me, you know, also very much growing up in an environment that was conservative and evangelical and all those things, um, and not knowing or probably knowing, but not knowing the stories of a lot mm -hmm. of people that had these experiences, you know, the big thing that obviously comes up is the scripture and your own theology and the way that you view God and God's relation to the world and how we think we're supposed to relate to each other and all those things that are wonderful things to discuss, but um, seem to get pigeonholed into these certain verses and, um, and used over and over to justify a certain position. So I'm wondering how, how you've handled that as a, as a minister, how that's come up for maybe people you've talked with, um, where you found entry points to move people beyond or through some of those, um, th that pushback, I guess. Yeah, yeah, this is something I think that comes up over and over again. Um, people wanting very, wanting particular Bible verses to, um, to back up their claims and assumptions. And uh, it's not just abortion, right? This is like, you name the topic and people have said, well, the Bible says, um, on both sides of, of any issue you might pick. And I, I draw wisdom from a Baptist preacher, Harry Fosdick. And uh, Harry Fosdick, in a debate about biblical literalism was encouraging folks to uh, use a little bit more imagination. And he pointed out um, very often that the Bible closes without a definitive, um, without definitive opposition to slavery. But that um, as we study the text, what we are to do is to try to discern the arc of the narrative. And the arc of the biblical narrative is, is freedom, right? We can conclude that the Bible really does not support slavery, even though it never closes without saying slavery is bad and there's right. very particular prescriptions for slavery. Um, but ultimately, we can come to the conclusion that the arc of the narrative bends towards freedom. And so as we look, when we talk about abortion, um, that's, uh, that's one of the things that we, I think we need to hold in our minds. That's one of the, the strategies that I have a, approached. Mm -hmm. But I will say the other approach is to back up a little, keeping in mind, remember that we're talking, we're not talking about abortion as a problem, but as a symptom. Mm -hmm. It's a symptom. And uh, Christians are, I think, are particularly... Uh, responsible for speaking to this because of Christian patriarchy and paternalism yeah. and this idea that uh, you know I think it, it's really rooted in the theology of the fall and mm -hmm. blaming Eve for everything um, when we don't ever hear that out of the mouth of Jesus um, um, and, and that ultimately we we know that um, those those stories are talking about all uh, many different things, but not necessarily uh, the divine order of hierarchy. Um, and if we again follow the arc of the narrative, it all points towards freedom, including freedom for women and, and recognition that women are in fact moral agents created by God to for dis, the 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 very serious work of discernment. Wow! Yeah, yeah. from your lips to the to the Alabama state houses here, <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> or the Supreme Court, or wherever. This, right. Uh, ends up going, but anyway, Lori, thank you so much for your time and sharing some of your experience and wisdom. Um, we really appreciate it. Glad to glad to visit with you, and um, we'll talk soon. <laughs>